started. I know we might be still hearing a couple more beeps as people join, um, but it will at least give me some time to get through the welcome and introductions. Um, so with that, just welcome. Thank you for joining. Uh, my, again, my name is Leah Hermans. I'm the program manager for on-farm trials. And this is the applicant webinar for uh, any of our partners or folks that are interested in applying to this year's on-farm trials competition. Um, just a couple of background notes. Uh, there is gonna be about half an hour or so worth of content that I'll be presenting in terms of the overview of the program and what to expect for this year's competition, which will leave us a generous amount of time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Feel free to enter the questions into the chat box as they come up. Um, just one note, please keep yourself on mute. Um, no, it looks like we've got a good group joining today. And um, I do have some colleagues that will be helping go through to mute people. Um, but when you have a group this size, sometimes it can take some time to find out who, you know, where the background noise is coming from. So please just be conscious of that and keep yourself on mute at all time. Um, again, this this meeting is being recorded and we'll be posting the presentation to the SIG website. Um, that can sometimes take a week or two or three um, to get up. So um, we'll have the slides available. I can um, it, I'll actually just throw them in the chat box right now. And um, and so, yeah, if you if you have questions or if you if you need an extra copy of the slides, feel free to reach out to our SIG inbox, which I'll be putting that that email address up in just a moment um, to get that information. And, um, you know, just before we kick things off, I want to say thank you for your interest in this program. Uh, the quality of our program, the foundation of it is really the quality of applicants and applications that we get in. Um, so we're really grateful that you're interested in the program and that you're taking the time today to learn a little bit more um, to see if you're the right fit and, and hopefully be able to um, get your proposal uh, together to um, to have a competitive proposal for our, our program this year. All right, so let me just uh, throw my slides into the chat box so you all have those available. All right, it's not pulling over. Um, Jean, if by chance you're able to pull the slide deck that I just sent you the PDF of and put it in the chat box, I'd appreciate that. So that comes up for everybody. Um, okay, I'm also you. gonna just take my video off to save my bandwidth as I dig into the content here. All right. Um, so again, welcome and thank you. And um, I'll start things off with just some background on the program. Um, On-farm trials was first authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. So this is our fifth competition. It's a relatively new program. Um, it is a component of the Conservation Innovation Grants, which is itself part of the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is often referred to as EQIP. Uh, the OFT competition includes the Soil Health Demo Trial Priority, which is a subcomponent for projects that strictly relate to the implementation of soil health practices and systems. And I mentioned that because our soil health demo projects require some unique responsibilities on the part of the grantee. And I will get into those details later in the presentation. All right, I think off the bat, it's helpful to make some distinctions between our SIG Classic program, which is the SIG program as it's existed since 2004, um, which several folks might be familiar with, and then this program, the On-Farm Trials program that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so first off, SIG Classic funds the development and piloting of new approaches and technologies. So the key here is it's more for early stage exploration of innovative practices, and that the projects, you know, there's not a guarantee uh, success in terms of the conservation outcomes for these projects. 
So in any cases where more field testing should be done before the practice is scaled, SIG Classic is going to be a better fit. Um, as I mentioned that, if you think that, as I described these, if you think that's a better fit for your program, the SIG Classic NFO is up and accepting proposals right now. So I'll put in a little plug for it. You know, as we dive through this, if you think you're a better fit for SIG Classic, um, go to grants.gov. And if you type in CIG into the search, I think as of this morning, four programs came up. Um, one was on farm trials and one is SIG Classic. So feel free to learn more about that competition um, if you think that's a better fit. Um, so where SIG Classic focuses on the development and piloting, on-farm trials instead focuses on adoption and evaluation of these innovative technologies. And we in on-farm trials are looking for technologies that have a known benefit and are ready to be scaled up. So the focus here is really on adoption and getting these practices, practices out into the field. Um, on-farm trials, you know, with that, on-farm trials also has some clear structural components that its projects need to have. Um, the big one being that our awardees have to make incentive payments to participating producers to incentivize them to adopt these practices. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say this up front, just I, so many times, like my team will do the initial vetting of proposals and I'll open up proposals and the very first sentence is, you know, begins with, we propose to develop such and such technology or practice. And if you're starting off with, you know, developing, refining, testing, a SIG Classic is going to be a more appropriate fit. Um, because in on-farm trials, we're focused on scaling up adoption, we are really looking at practices that we know are going to have a benefit. We don't want to scale up things that we're unsure what the effects are going to be. All right, so um, here's a snapshot of last year's competition and the breakdown of the applicants we received. Of the 55 proposals that passed the initial vetting, we ended up funding 14 projects for a total of $25 million. And you can see the breakdown per priority category here. All right, so um, here we have the application essentials that you'll need to know in order to get started. Uh, the first place to start for anyone interested in the program is to read the notice of funding opportunity. My guess is that most of you have already at least opened it or know where it is or are familiar with it. You know, this the posting, the link to this webinar was in it. So um, chances are likely that most of you have gotten this far. Um, but so the, the NFO can be found on grants.gov. Um, I put the opportunity number here. I know it's a little bit long, but like I said, if you go to grants.gov and type in OFT or CIG into the search, there are very few. If you type in OFT as of this morning, it was the only response that came back. Um, so it'll get you right there. Um, so the notice of op funding opportunity has all the key information that you'll need to know in terms of what we're looking to fund and kind of uh, what the rules of the game are and what you'll need to apply. Um, so if you haven't read the NFO already, I highly encourage you to start there before taking any other steps. Uh, so this year, all applications will be submitted through grants.gov. Uh, the NFO has all the details on what you'll need to submit those applications. Um, if you have questions that are specific to the submission process or technical questions around your account or applying through Grants.gov, please contact the Grants.gov applicant support. Um, we don't have any control or access to the site or your accounts, um, so we will not be able to support you there. If you reach out to us, we'll probably direct you right to this number and email that's on the screen and also in the NFO. Um, they can help you with any technical issues or account issues you're encountering on this on the grant stock of site. Um, and so let's see. Um, so it, it's also um, probably worth calling out that you have to be registered in SAM before submitting an application. Um, and with that, you will be provided a UEI, a unique identity number um, in the application. And um, so that was 
something that came up new, I believe it was last year, the government replaced Dunn's number with the UEI. Um, and so those are requested through and assigned by SAM.gov. That registration can take several weeks. Um, so that is something to get started on right away if you don't yet have the UEI number. Um, and I'll, I'll just reiterate that we are only accepting proposals through grants.gov. We won't accept them through email or any other manner. Um, so the proposal due date is October 30th. Uh, we say this every year, we strongly encourage applicants to submit their package at least 24 to 48 hours in advance. October 30th is a Monday, um, so get it in the Friday before or over the weekend. Give yourself a full business day to work out any technical issues. It's every year we get one or two folks that call or email at you know 11 p.m. the day proposals are due, and there's just nothing we can do to help you at that time. Um, don't it, it's heartbreaking. We we want to see your applications. We are looking for these quality proposals. Um, we don't want to miss out on reviewing your proposal due to a technical glitch, a technicality, an issue where something wasn't being attached right and you weren't able to hit that submit button. If you don't get it in before 1159 on October 30th, we will not see it. They do not get sent to our team. So just a plea to please um, hit that submit button early. Don't wait until the last minute to do so. Um, all right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about funding. This year we have $50 million available. Um, that is double what we have had in previous years. So I'll state that again, you know, we, we doubled our available funding. That is that is huge. That's uh, very noteworthy. Um, another notable change from this year is that matching funds are no longer required. Um, what hasn't changed is that uh, just like in previous years, we have a maximum award size of five million dollars. Uh, Two hundred and fifty thousand is the minimum award size and projects can last from three to five years in duration. So historically underserved. OK, so um, this year, as in previous as last year, we're setting aside 10 percent of the OFT funding for projects that entirely benefit historically underserved producers. So to qualify for the historically underside, uh, sorry, historically underserved set aside, uh, applicants must meet one of these three criteria. The first being uh, a community-based organization comprised of representing or exclusively working with HU producers for the life of the project. The second being an entity developing an innovative conservation approach or technology specifically targeting the unique needs and limitations of HU producers for the life of the project. Or the third being um, an 1890 or 1994 land grant institution, Hispanic serving institution or other minority serving institution, such as a historically black college or university, a tribal controlled college or university, or Asian American and Pacific Islander serving institution at the time of your application. So if you want to apply for the HU set aside, you will do so by following the instructions in the NFO. Um, namely, you have to state that you're competing for the HU set aside in the application cover page, and you have to note which of these three qualifiers applies to you or to the, or to the applicant. Um, all right, so here are our priorities for this year. All right, um, irrigation management nutrient management and the soil health demo trials have remained the same, broadly remained the same from last year. However, however, there have been some changes made, you know, within the sub priorities or a description of each priority. So I would reread that if you're reapplying. Um, we did add two new priorities this year, one being grazing lands and the other is feeding management and enteric methane reductions. Uh, one thing to note here is that applicants must choose one priority for their proposal. A very frequently asked question that we get is, you know, somebody saying that their proposal touches on multiple, maybe two, sometimes three priorities, and they want to know if if they can apply to three priorities, if there's some benefit to um, 
to covering more priorities. There is not. Covering more than one priority will neither hurt nor help you in the application process. The reason you have to choose one priority is that we have peer panels with expertise specific to each of these priorities. So the priority category that you choose will determine which peer panel reviews your proposal. And so that needs to be selected at your discretion. Um, we cannot advise you as to which priority to apply for, um, but you can only select one. Great. Um, so now I want to uh, take a minute to talk more about the soil health demo priority specifically, um, because like I mentioned before, there are some unique things that are specific to this priority. Uh, the goal of the priority is to support more widespread adoption of soil health management systems and practices. The biggest extra piece here is related to the evaluation protocol. Um, so we work with our awardees to use consistent evaluation protocols and methods for assessing soil carbon changes and other soil health outcomes, including economics. Um, so there's a robust evaluation piece standard for soil health demo trials. Uh, our other priorities also have an evaluation requirement, but it's not prescriptive. It's not as prescriptive as the soil health demo trials. Um, and the last thing to note here is that the um, applicants or the, the awardees from the soil health demo trial priority um, need to, uh, the producers are, who participate in these projects will need to consent to using NRCS or to, to NRCS using data for a congressionally mandated report. All right, so here there are, this is kind of the, again, the mile, the, the high level overview of the program. There are really three big pieces to each on-farm trials project. There's beauty, there is value in the simplicity. And kind of each project should follow this structure and kind of have this narrative to how it's set up. Um, so we're looking at increasing adoption. We're looking at scaling up these practices and getting them into the field. And we do that um, three ways. The first is providing incentive payments to producers, and those are paid by the grantee, by the awardee, directly to the producers. Um, uh, NRCS does not get involved in that transaction. Um, so incentives to get producers to adopt the practice. The second is the grantee will also provide technical assistance to assist the producers with implementing the innovative practice. Um, so we're, we're incentivizing, we're assisting, we're with the, facilitating the adoption. And then lastly, there's the uh, evaluation component where grantees will um, demonstrate the natural resource um, and economic and to the extent possible social benefits of the on-farm trials uh, that were implemented. Um, so uh, we expect that applicants will either have the capacity um, for to, to manage all three of these parts or they will partner with somebody who does. Um, the lead applicant will often work with with multiple partners to cover all, you know, make sure all three of these pieces are covered. Uh, I want to just note here that the statute for on-farm trials allows NRCS to implement the program one of two ways, either ourselves or through our partners, the you all, through our, the en eligible entities who apply. Um, we are going with the latter this year again. Um, so we're really looking for partners who can help the agency identify the most promising innovative technologies and approaches. Um, we're looking for partners who have access to producer networks uh, that they can tap into to, um, to implement these technologies um, and that they can handle the technical assistance either by themselves or with partners to really get these activities on the ground and then to evaluate them to again demonstrate um, how successful the conservation activities are. Um, another frequently asked question that we get is around incentive payments. Um, folks ask if there is a desired percentage of the budget that should go to incentive payments. Um, the answer is no. So there's no expected breakdown of the budget in terms of how much goes to incentive payments and how much goes to other items. Um, the thing to note here is we don't want the incentive payments to be an afterthought. Um, you know, they should, as long as they are thoughtfully put together to say, 
you know, the, the, again, the narrative should be, this is a, a, a great promising technology that needs to be scaled up. And then here is how we are going to incentivize producers to adopt it. And so that incentive package, again, that, that we just want it to be uh, thoughtfully presented. Um, you know, what are you doing to get producers to adopt this, whatever uh, technology or approach you are proposing? Um, and so, uh, yes, that it, it can be, you know, small, a smaller portion of the budget for some projects and a larger portion for the others. It really, it just depends on what makes sense for your particular technology or approach. Okay, uh, so this is a flyover of a few typical events in an on-farm trials project. So again, the proposals will be submitted by October 30th. That's the deadline. Um, we roughly expect to make the award announcement in January of next year, 2024. And we anticipate that projects will begin in May of 2024. Um, these dates are estimates. Um, they can vary, you know, sometimes by weeks, sometimes by months. So just understand that those are estimates. Uh, I know this past year we were um, off more than usual. Um, you know, sometimes we have staffing changes or policy changes that don't allow us to hit that mark. Um, so just understanding those are estimates, but, you know, we did sketch out a timeline um, for what to expect. And so that that May 2024 is kind of a rough estimate for when projects would, when um, the agreements would be finalized and projects would kick off. And so then to kick off the projects, um, we hold a new awardee orientation. And the awardees are able to consult with an NRCS technical contact that's assigned to them. Um, after that, the partner will identify producers. And I guess, in, you know, in some cases, the partners will already have the producers selected. So that's another frequently asked question that we get is if producers need to be identified in the proposal, they do not. Um, but applicants who don't have producers selected ahead of time just need to clearly describe what their plan is and their ability is to recruit producers and what producers they're targeting. So uh, how many producers, you know, where, you know, if they have a, a stat strategy for HU recruitment. I think I, I miss a slide there. I did not. Okay. Um, so either way, um, once the agreements are finalized and the producers are selected, uh, the awardees will work with NRCS to confirm producer eligibility. Um, so we'll talk about the details of that in just a minute. Um, and they also need to complete the environmental evaluations for their project site. Um, another thing to note is these environmental evaluations can take several weeks. Um, sometimes you know, in more complex complex situations, it can take several months to complete them. Um, so that's just, and no ground disturbing activity can take place until they're done. So that's worth noting because if we have an estimated start date of May, 2024, um, it's unlikely you're gonna be doing any ground breaking uh, activities in June. Um, so again, just kind of make sure you build that flexibility into your timeline, knowing that once the awards are finalized, there is some time uh, that will be needed in order to do the producer eligibility checks and the environmental evaluations. Um, so once those are complete, that's when the real fun gets kicked off and, and the work gets moving. Um, partners are able uh, to make the incentive payments to the participating producers. They're able to provide that technical assistance to implement the trials. And then over time, they'll evaluate the, the conservation, economic uh, and social to the extent possible, the, the outcomes of the trials. Um, and then in addition, throughout the project, awardees will submit semi-annual progress reports, annual financial reports, and ultimately a uh, project, a final project report. All right, so um, let's talk about eligible entities or eligible applicants. Um, there are three broad categories of eligible entities outlined in the statute. The first is private entities whose primary business is related to agriculture. The second is nonprofits with experience working with agricultural producers. And the third is non-federal government agencies. So for example, uh, public universities 
but fall under non-federal government agencies. Uh, private universities can apply as nonprofits with experience working with agricultural producers. Um, you know, small, large businesses would fit as private entities if their primary business is related to agriculture. Um, the notable uh, exceptions of folks that are not eligible to apply are individuals and other federal entities. Those two groups are not eligible applicants. Uh, we do every year have a handful of producers who reach out with interest at this phase. And so I just want to talk about that for a minute. First thing is if a producer applies as an individual, so Jane Farmer, um, that would not be an eligible applicant, uh, could not apply, can't move forward. Uh, if the producer applies as the farm entity, so Jane Farmer Dairy Co, um, that could be an eligible applicant. I just want to um, provide some considerations in that context. Um, producers are often participants in our projects. Um, so far, uh, they're rarely uh, going to be the, the applicant. Um, the reason for that is uh, twofold. One, um, so if, if a producer is looking to do something on their own land, um, that's not going to be appropriate for on-farm trials because we're not looking for single demonstration sites. We are looking for a partner who is able to uh, scale this technology, so bring it, give it to multiple producers. I, I think the lowest uh, number of producer participants we've had on an on-farm trials project was four or five. Um, the most we've had is upwards of 200. So it can range greatly um, dependent on how complex the technology is. Um, but we're not looking it for, you know, we, we want something that you can uh, evaluate and you're really not going to get an evaluation from a single site, um, a, robu a robust evaluation from a single site. So we're not looking for, for single site projects. We're looking for somebody who is going to recruit producer participants and put this on their land. Also, an individual producer, it's going to be a hard argument to make. You know, we're looking to incentivize folks to adopt these things. If you already know how to do it and are willing to do it, you probably, you don't need on-farm trials to get yourself to do it. So that, that, that if you're looking to do something on your own land, um, uh, or if you're looking to do a single demonstration site, another program, a diff different programs would likely be better suited for you. It's that's not appropriate for on-farm trials. Um, it's also worth noting that um, on-farm trial, you know, federal grants in general are not for the faint of heart. Um, there are uh, administrative complexities and, you know, again, we're looking for folks who can do the technical assistance, who can administer the incentive payments, who can do the evaluation or partner with folks who can. Um, so uh, the, our applicants need to have a team that can do that and show that they have that expertise in their proposal. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, producers are often best served as participants of the on farm trials project and um, the are not usually well positioned to lead uh, a, pro a project. But let me talk about producer participants for a moment because there are some requirements for participating producers who receive on-farm trials incentives. Uh, the first being that they must be equip eligible. So that includes that they be in compliance with highly erodible lands and wetland conservation provisions. In addition, they must meet the adjusted gross income requirement of the farm bill. AGI waivers can be requested for land that is of special environmental significance. Um, so these waivers will only be granted when an NRCS analysis determines that the conservation activity in question would take place on land of special environmental significance and the activity would address the issues that classified that land as being of special environmental significance. The reason this is worth calling out is this waiver is not intended to be a general waiver or a catch-all for folks who don't meet the requirement but want to participate. They are very narrow, very specific circumstances under which somebody would be granted a waiver. Um, so if your project, you know, just consider the producers that would participate and you want to make sure um, that you can recruit folks that um, meet that AGI requirement. 
Um, all right, so and compliance gesture. All right, so um, the awardees are going to work with NRCS staff to ensure that all participating producers receiving the incentive payments meet these eligibility requirements before any payments are made. Um, and uh, another thing worth noting is that incentive payments received from an on-farm trial grant do not count towards a producer's equip payment limitation. And NRCS will work with awardees to complete the producer eligibility checks. So there should not be any additional cost associated with this. OK, um, so this slide outlines in broad strokes the expected NRCS involvement in a project. So again, it's we will help facilitate the uh, NEPA activities or the environmental evaluations. Um, we will assist with confirming the producer eligibility, and then we assign somebody who will provide you general technical oversight. Who That person will be your NRCS technical contact. And they can provide guidance and, and check in with your project um, at, at a high level. All right, uh, so I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. Um, for matching funds this year, we are not required. We do not have a match requirement. Um, another thing we're calling out is uh, match value added match will not be considered in the project evaluation criteria. What that means is our peer panels will not evaluate matching funds as part of the project evaluation. So there's not going to be it's neither going to hurt nor harm you if you have matching funds. There's really no need to include matching funds in your budget. Additional key points. OK, so um, no on-farm trials funding can be used to pay for partner administrative costs. Um, so indirect costs cannot be included in the budget. This is a statutory limitation that we do not we're not able to can to change. Um, so while indirect costs are not allowed in in the budget, direct administrative expenses. So things like filling out reports, attending meetings, you know, direct expenses that you're able to um, tie to the project activities are allowable costs. All right, so with that, um, we can move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, again, feel free to type any questions that you have into that chat box. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can today, but if your question doesn't get answered, we can add it to our frequently asked questions document that will be posted to the SIG website. Um, if you have questions that are specific to your project and really not appropriate for a general audience, feel free to email them to the inbox that's listed on the slide here. That's nrcscig at usda.gov. Uh, due to the competitive nature of this funding opportunity, we can't advise applicants on putting together their proposals or comment on the merit of a proposal. So we can only answer clarifying questions um, about the information provided in the NFO. That's something worth calling out. I know we often get folks coming to us describing their proposal and kind of asking if it's a good idea, and we are not allowed to comment on that. Um, so. Uh, I, I don't want people to read into that either for better or for worse. It's just something we're not able to do, um, but we're happy to answer any clarifying questions that you come up along the way. All right, um, so my colleague Caroline mm -hmm. is joining me today and she'll help me um, kind of go through the questions that we have in our inbox now. Okay, ready for the first one, Leah? I am ready. There is a, a bunch of them have appeared, so. Okay. Um, will this initiative consider aquaculture, that is producers culturing aquatic organisms? Um, that's a great question, and the answer is yes. Um, so aquaculture uh, can, any aquaculture related production can apply for on-farm trials. It just needs to uh, meet one of the priorities. So it has to fit into one of the priorities that's described in the NFO. But yes, there's there's no reason that aquaculture would be excluded from this opportunity. Is there a public listing of who won the SIG last year for soil health trials? There is, yes. We have, um, oh, you know what? Um, we have the 
I'm just pulling up our website right now to see where it is listed. Um, and I'm realizing it was added in, it was in a, a press release that went out um, when the awards were made, but um, that's no longer on our website. I apologize for that. One of the reasons is because those projects are going to go onto our project search tool. So in the SIG website, we have a project search tool where you can filter out um, projects. Uh, specifically, you can look at projects that were awarded to the Soil Health Demo awardees all the way back to the initiation of the, the program. Um, the reason those projects are not in there yet is because not all of them have been finalized. Um, so I apologize for that, but if you reach out to the um, SIG and RCS um, inbox that we have up on the screen here, um, we can get you a link to that press release so you can see all the folks who were awarded last year. Okay, this is a, a multi-tiered question. Um, I'll, I'll just give them what I'll give you one piece at a time. What is the minimum number and size of producers for, for a project? <clears throat> Um, so uh, technically, the minimum number is going to be two producers, plural. We have not yet seen a project be competitive that is that small. Um, the number of producers that's appropriate is really going to depend upon the complexity of the approach that you are proposing. If it's something that's really expensive and really complex, we have seen as few as I think it's I know five, I, maybe four producer participants. Um, if it's something that is not as complex or expensive, we have seen 200 plus producer participants. Um, so the right amount of producers for your project is really going to depend on kind of your capacity to recruit, um, your ability to pay for and provide technical assistance to those producers. How many types of crops or can one crop be used across multiple producers? Do, and do they have to be in different growing regions? Um, they do not have to be in different growing regions, and there is nothing that excludes one crop from being used. Um, I am just checking our NFO right now. Um, I believe in the evaluation criteria. Uh, I'm going to pull that up as I respond to this. The evaluation criteria, one of, uh, yes, okay, so in the first evaluation criteria, it, it does describe that the innovative conservation approach tested has applicability for a range of agricultural operation sizes and types. So there's going to be a preference given, but that's um, one kind of bullet point in the evaluation criteria. Um, we have seen projects that focus on one crop. Um, uh, it, there's nothing that would exclude that. Can environmental evaluations be exempted if there is no negative impact on the environment based on the idea? No, we do need to do the environmental evaluations, um, but the idea is that these projects are going to have no negative impact. We are recruiting projects that have a conservation benefit. Um, so the environmental evaluation is tends to be an easy thing to do if it's clear, as, as described, that there is going to be no potential negative benefit or negative repercussions to the trial. Can trials be conducted at university research farms? Um, can they be included as comparison in a proposed trial? Uh, yes, they can and they have in the past. Um, so again, the, the focus is on adoption and scalability and getting these um, into onto the fields of equip-eligible producers. If you can make a good argument for why uh, a, a control field is needed, that that's that could be eligible within the evaluation expense uh, kind of general category of a project. What's the fine line between SIG Classic and on-farm trials in terms of established technology to be tested? Is any tangible benefits observed at experimental field required? Um, so we don't have any set requirement. That is really um, your proposal is going to be more competitive if you can show that there's a proven conservation benefit. Um, that that's kind of up to each applicant to decide how where on that spectrum the technology or approach is. Um, uh, 
it, it's going to depend on the the priority uh, as well and kind of where the field is at. Um, but the the kind of heart of the answer to that is, again, we are going to be scaling these up. We are putting them in the fields of producers. If we're not sure how well they're going to work or if they're going to work or what the outcome is going to be, we don't want to be spreading these widely. We're, we're looking for stuff that we're, we know is going to have a positive impact. Um, but there's not a set def definition or expectation around exactly what folks need to prove. Um, that's just going to be up to each individual applicant um, to stake their case that this technology is ready to be scaled. Can tribes that have greenhouses on a reservation be considered urban agriculture? Leah, do you want me to jump in on this one? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, there, we don't really have a set definition of urban agriculture. So I, I know that, that um, the USDA Urban Ag Office, uh, I think, I don't, I don't know if they, I don't think they've finalized a definition, but they, they do include um, rural communities of um, a certain size, um, you know, that are in like a small town. So, um, I, I would believe that you would qualify if you have greenhouses, but I think what happens sometimes is there can be, you know, panel bias because um, so it would be good to always explain why you fit into the urban ag definition. Um, yeah, I guess one addition yeah. to that is we don't we don't have an urban ag priority this year, but urban agriculture yeah. is welcome under all priorities. Um, so there wouldn't necessarily be a need to qualify as urban agriculture if you have an an idea that may or may not fit under urban agriculture. Again, we we welcome urban agriculture, but it's it's not a required component of any of the priorities. Okay, that's that's helpful too. Um, are tribes considered non-federal? Uh, yes, I believe so. Tri tribes are eligible applicants. Can a producer be? Uh, let's see. An L uh, let's see. I'm going to skip that. Do you require letters of support and contribution from project partners? Uh, good question. We do not require letters of support. You are welcome to submit them with your proposal. Um, we do not require letters of contribution. We do not have a match requirement. Um, so we are kind of agnostic to additional um, funding that comes in. So there's absolutely no need to send in a letter of contribution because that, that would not be considered as part of the review criteria. Are previous awardees eligible to apply for funding for a different project? They are eligible and welcomed. Yes. Let's see. OK, um, someone put in here um, a slide that differs from the the NOFO. Um, I'm going to skip that one because I think um, if if that person could actually email us, I think we can answer that one better because it's something visual. We're at two universities. One of them is a minority serving institution. Which entity should lead the proposal? Um, so if you are intending to apply for the 10% HU set aside, the applicant themselves has to be um, of the of the institution that, that meets the qualification, if that makes sense. So if you're part, if there are two universities, one meets the requirement for the HU set aside and one does not, in order to apply, so it has to be the primary applicant. Um, alternatively, you could apply not HU set aside. Um, HU participation is included in the criteria for all proposals. Um, so we have a set aside 10% that will get priority um, based on whether they qualify for that. Uh, but even if you don't qualify, your inclusion of historically underserved producers will be considered by the peer panel. Can budgets for these projects include support for graduate students? Yes, they can. Are all producers involved in the projects required to receive incentive payments? And if they are not expecting to receive payments, do they still have to be EQIP eligible? That is an excellent question. 
Um, so non equip eligible producers are allowed to participate in an on farm trials project, but they cannot receive any financial benefit. Um, so they can't really receive an incentive payment, supplies or equipment, which means that they can participate, but really they would just be providing data. Um, we welcome that. I, I don't know how many you know producers would want to do that out of generosity there, but they're, they're more than welcome to. It's just um, if they're going to receive a financial benefit through project funds, they have to be equip eligible. OK, hey, um, I, I, I'm going to read you this next question. I, I've read it a couple times, so I'll give you my interpretation too. If the AGI waivers are granted with critical land, how does this impact a project that focuses on climate smart conservation activity? The impact is to the atmosphere. Is this type of project then excluded? Um, so I think they're asking if they do the work on something called critical land. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the project impacts the atmosphere. You know, is that an allowable project? Um, so I, I, the, the question is kind of hitting on two notes here. The AGI waiver is like a binary. Either you get it or you don't get it. Um, so that is that is for projects that, you know, they uh, the applic the participating producer does not meet the AGI requirement, but they are on land of special environmental. Um, I'm, I'm starting to do the slides right now, but they are on that land of special environmental significance. Um, so again, that that's just uh, that's a very rare thing that we have not yet seen. Um, but if you're not looking for that waiver, then there's nothing that would uh, I, I think that that maybe if you have a question about that waiver specifically ask us to be honest, that is not something we have dealt with as of yet. Um, we have had a few folks reach out uh, awardees reach out because they need the waivers. And as they got started, they realized that their applicants was not on this land of special environmental significance. Therefore, they were not eligible for the waiver. If you're not expecting, if you don't expect to need the waiver, then it's not even something uh, that should be considered at this time. I hope that helps. Um, but yeah, that, that's just not that that's again a, a rare situation that we really haven't encountered yet because it's such a, a narrow um, situation in which somebody would be on this land the project activities would be addressing the issues that got them classified as this land. Can the same PI organization or organization submit two different proposals? Yes, um, we've had that before. Um, they can be two different proposals as long as they are for two different projects. So clearly you can't submit or you shouldn't submit a proposal twice um, but if you have two completely different project ideas um, you can submit two proposals yes and can we file multiple applications for different priorities um, yes as long as they are different projects please do not submit the same project to multiple priorities um, again that um, priority you select is just going to determine the peer panel that reviews your proposal. We do not have a situation in, in which one proposal is reviewed by multiple peer panels. Um, there are situations in which projects are complex and require a range of expertise in which a peer panel will choose to bring in expertise from outside that peer panel. Um, that is at the discretion of the panel lead, um, but each applicant will only be reviewed once by one peer panel. And so the priority you select is going to determine which peer panel reviews your proposal. If I submitted a proposal in the past for this year's submission, should I address previous comments from the reviewer panel? Um, no, not necessarily. No, um, you by address, if you mean uh, adjust your proposal, yes, um, but there's not ne not necessarily a need to call out um, uh, in, in comments or so that certain things have been changed. Oftentimes our peer panels change from year to year. So the reviewers themselves are not stagnant, um, which means 
uh, you will have you will likely have a fresh set of eyes looking at your proposal. Um, the value of that feedback is the uh, you will see kind of what the last year's uh, peer panel saw as the deficiencies of the program of, of your project. So if those deficiencies exist, it's very likely that the new panel is is going to point to them as well. But if they're corrected, that's the idea of why we provide that feedback. Feedback is so that. Um, that they can be just corrected and then uh, resubmitted as a proposal that doesn't have those uh, issues or deficiencies. For evaluation, should I include a local NRCS scientist in the proposal? Um, no, our our uh, so we prioritize proposals in which the technical assistance is um, given completely by the awardee or by a partner. Um, there are circumstances under which we could get NRCS staff involved in providing technical assistance, but we prioritize proposals that can cover the technical assistance wholly through their own organization or through partners. Um, we, in general, do not like to see uh, NRCS employees, federal employees, as part of an application team. That's a conflict of interest. Um, so, no, it, it, they should not include NRCS employees as part of the application. How often will the NRCS TA provider visit sites? Um, it's a good question. It varies project to project. I think our goal is to have the TA provider visit each site once. Um, sometimes it can be twice if they go early on in the project and later in the project. You know, if they're nearby, they're welcome to visit more time. It's just a, a limitation in terms of what we have funding for. Um, the past several years have been weird with uh, travel restrictions as a result of, of COVID. Um, so we've, we've gone a couple of years where uh, our um, NRCS technical contacts have not visited our fields. And just this past year, we've, we've opened that up and, and we're starting to get more folks out on the ground talking with our awardees, thankfully, because I know I know how much value that provides both to the technical contact and to the awardee. Okay. Um, okay, if you have a successful track record with a solution product in another market, but deals with similar needs of the ag industry, are we encouraged to apply, especially if it is at the result request of producers? Um, so if I understand this question correctly, um, I, I think that will be up. It will really depend on how strong, strong of a case you can make that the application is like proven and ready to be scaled up. Um, so if you are applying something to the ag industry for the first time and there's some question as to exactly what the expected results may be, um, you might want to look at SIG Classic instead to do that testing. Um, but if you can show in your proposal um, that you are working with a technology uh, practice that um, they're, you know, you, you is ready to be scaled up and ready to go into producers fields, um, then then yes, that would be an appropriate one for on farm trials. Is a private for-profit organization developing a soil health product eligible to apply? Uh, private industries are eligible to apply. Let me just pull up the evaluation criteria or the eligibility in the NFO so I can take a second look at this so I get the wording correct. Um, so private entities whose primary business is related to agriculture. So if you are a private industry who's developing, I, I missed the phrasing of that, soil health. What was that, Caroline, again? Okay, sorry. Um, and if, if you've lost it, yeah. um, you don't have to go back to it. I think that the idea is soil just that health if you, product, Soil yeah. health product eligibility. Yeah, soil health product eligibility. And again, we're this is where we there's limits in terms of like how we're able to comment on an individual applicant. But yes, it, it you know if your primary business is related to ag, um, private entities are welcome to and encouraged to apply. Okay. Um, 
so they were talking this one. They're talking about the historical uh, historically underserved set aside. Is is this a requirement or an optional add in for the set aside funds? Um, the, the, it says for FY 2023 award process, at least 10% of the total funds available are set aside that entirely benefit HG producers. So is this a requirement or an optional op optional add in? I'm 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 assuming they're asking for the whole program. Uh, so if I understand the question correctly, the HU set aside is you either qualify or you don't. Um, so you either qualify um, to have that priority consideration, that 10 percent consideration, or you don't. If you don't qualify for the HU set aside, you're still more than welcome to apply. And we still very much encourage you to include historic land or serve producers because that is part of the general re review criteria for all applicants. But if you don't meet the HU set aside um, definition, you're still welcome. Uh, there's still plenty of room for you in our, our um, competition. We still welcome you to apply. Can an applicant that manufactures the conservation technology apply to provide producer incentives that include the cost of providing the equipment on their farm? So the applicant manufactures the technology. So you manufacture the technology and then uh, you would pay producers to then buy that technology. The, the answer to that would be yes. Um, producer incentives can be made up of a variety of different things. And so it's really up to the applicant to describe the appropriateness of those incentives. They can be equipment, they can be supplies. It, you know, you could say we're giving each person a hundred dollars. This is just a, a kind of a, a a straw man example. So this is obviously not refined, but like if you're giving everybody a hundred dollars to um, to cover the evaluation, the time that they're going to spend with the data collection for the evaluation, um, you could provide producers the hundred dollars to cover the equipment that it would um, cost them to uh, implement this or or the supplies. Um, one consideration here is incentive payments can be a mix of a cash payment and equipment and supplies and other things that you, instead of giving them $100 to buy the equipment, you, well, it wouldn't be equipment if it's that low, but instead of giving them $100 to buy the supplies, you would just give them the supplies. Um, but that has to be in addition to a payment. So all incentives must include some cash payments to producers. They can be just cash payments, or it can be a combination of cash payments and equipment and supplies. Does that make sense? And so we have. It, it, oh. oh, it does. But OK, go ahead. Yeah, we have had uh, private companies that manufacture a certain equipment that have given that equipment to the producers as part of their incentive package. So to further this idea, what is an appropriate amount of an incentive? Yeah, that's going to be completely dependent on what is needed to get a producer to adopt the technology. Um, there's no there's no set appropriate amount. Um, one thing, if you're you know, we really rely on our applicants to propose an appropriate amount and and kind of justify why they think that's appropriate. If you don't know where to start and you're kind of having a hard time getting some some baseline for this, we do have um, our uh, I think we call it the um, payment schedule. It, it should be in the NFO. Let me see if I can find it so I can reference it appropriately. Um, let me see. Um, bear with me for one second here. OK, yes, so um, if you just simply, I believe you can just Google NRCS payment schedules and it will take you to a page that outlines the NRCS payment that's given for certain practices. So if you have no baseline for kind of what would be an appropriate payment, um, it tells you the rate that's paid by NRCS for practices and in what state or what region. So that might be a starting point if you if you're not sure 
kind of how to start incentivizing producers, you can at least see how NRCS does it for our conservation practices. Okay. Um, could you explain a little more about indirect costs? Specifically, how do you classify what is and is not a direct cost versus an indirect cost? Um, for example, reporting on the grant to NRCS, is that indirect or considered direct? Administering the funds such as incentive payments to producers or purchasing seed to be used in the trial, et cetera. Um, so I, I'm going to speak in kind of broad terms here. Uh, indirect costs are costs, that, they're kind of like the cost of doing business. It's usually considered overhead costs. Um, each organization, uh, I think that, you know, you define what is your indirect cost and what are direct costs, and you just need to be consistent with how you charge for those. Um, in general, if it's something like somebody's time for filling out a report for on-farm trials, that would be an activity that's can you can directly link to the project. Um, so you could say, you know, uh, Jane Farmer spent five hours. Okay, not, not Jane, I'll use a different name. Uh, Joe Smith, you spent five hours filling out this report. He charges at $100 an hour so that this is a, a cost that we're asking reimbursement for. That is something that we see and is common and is normal. Um, what we consider indirect cost or what are generally considered indirect cost are, like I said, that cost of kind of keeping the lights on, cost of doing business. Um, so if you have just general business expenses, the rent of your office space, um, you know, the electricity bill, the like uh, the those those type of things, the, those are just general administrative expenses um, that you cannot directly tie to, you know, the on-farm trials project. Um, those those get lumped in indirect expenses in general and cannot be reimbursed. Um, Caroline, I don't know if I just did that justice. Feel free to add on to that um, if you. I uh, can help with a more clear. I'm, I'm just also kind of searching through the NFO because I think I think we point to um, a better source that will uh, that will describe indirect and direct costs. Yeah, there's a, a specific section in 2 CFR that's 2 CFR 200 that is referenced in the NFO and linked. So if you want to dive into indirect costs and learn more about that um, in the notice of funding opportunity. Um, we provide links for for more information about direct cost and indirect cost and kind of how to calculate them and how to separate them. So we're at four minutes after the hour. I can oh. keep going for a, a little bit of time if, if you can stay on, Leah. Um, we still have take... 83 people. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Let's let's. I know, yeah. I, Caroline. I know we have a 4:15. So let's take two more questions and then okay. um, the questions beyond that, we'll we'll unfortunately have to um, respond to via email or um, in our frequently asked questions document. Um, do we have to identify producers at the time of the proposal? Um, no, you do not. Um, so sometimes our awardees know the producer participants up front. Um, if you do not, that's fine and, and normal. Um, we just want your application to include a description of what your capacity is to recruit producer participants and what your plan is and kind of which what producers in general you're seeking out. Um, so you want to give us confidence that you are going to be able to recruit the producer participants needed. Um, we've already received a SIG um, on farm trials project in the past. We have further improved it and would like to expand to more states to promote adoption. Are we eligible to apply for a new project? Uh, yes, it would have to be. Uh, yes, it would be a standalone project, so it cannot be a continuation of your last project. Um, but if you are applying to apply whatever technology or approach is, you know, in new regions with the new producers, then that as a standalone project would be an eligible project. It just can't be. You can't add to an award that already exists, you would create a new award, a new agreement for a standalone project. How does NRCS define, I'll do one more question. Yeah, How does NRCS do. define move beyond the research stage, specifically given the novelty of enteric methane reducing feed additives? Um, that's a, a good question, move beyond the research stage. So I'm not sure exactly what clause um, well, this is referring to, but uh, sorry, Caroline, did you? No, no, go ahead. 
Yeah, I think I think in general we're looking at, like I said, um, for on farm trials, because the point of on farm trials is to uh, actually get the approach or technology into the fields or into the hands of producers. Um, we just want something that is ready to be scaled. So move beyond the research phase means that like if you're again, I don't know exactly which clause this is referring to, but if you're if we're looking at, you know, how well does this work? Does this work? What are the effects? It's, it's going to be more of a SIG classic type project um, that is potentially refining, tweaking or testing, piloting new approaches. If you have, um, you know, reason to believe and are uh, that these projects are ready to be scaled because of conservation benefit um and you know there there might be some there, there it's a fine line when we talk about innovation in terms of on-farm trials um we need to know there's a benefit but there is also an evaluation component so you can say all right we're gonna implement these in the field we know they have a benefit the evaluation will tell us exactly what extent the the impact is going to have um i hope that helps but um there it is really again up to the awardees to make an argument that this technology or approach is ready to be placed in the fields. And, you know, we are not setting the producers up for failure, that we're giving them something that we know is going to have a benefit. Okay. There's okay. still a good amount of questions, so. Okay, we can, um, I know, Caroline, if you, I know you're the one who's leading that next meeting, so I don't want to, I, yeah. I can take one more if you want, and then, uh, and then, um, I, like I said, we got the, the email up on the, um screen here so we encourage you to reach out and i'll be uh taking a a copy of the questions that are in the chat box right now and adding them to our faq document is the general idea that all programs should not overlap with equip can you explain yeah the programs yeah. can overlap with equip um you know the general idea is that we are implementing practices that are not widely adopted um, and that are innovative in nature. But there's plenty of room to make an argument that um, there are some practices that may be equip practices or may be standard conservation practices that just are not, you know, we know they they work in the Southwest, but they haven't been applied there. How do we get them out there? So um, they do not have to be separate from equip practices. Or maybe guidance? there's a combination. Oh. Sorry, just one other thing. I know I know yeah. we've had awardees too that have used a combination of practices in an innovative way. Um, and that that was their their pitch for innovation is we know that these practices work. We think that if we combine them, it'll have an even greater effect. Do you have guidance on areas of regions of focus? Is it preferred to focus on a smaller set of states or regions, or is NRCS open to a national approach, including several states? Um, we are open to a multi-state approach. I think in general, we're looking for a greater impact. Um, so it depends on the technology or approach that you're um, proposing. Some of them are just regional in nature, and that is fine. Um, but uh, we're hoping to have a big impact. So if you're looking at one small region, one small part, and the technology is not going to be further scalable or applicable to other regions, you're still welcome to apply. Your proposal just might not be as competitive as somebody who's able to cover a larger area, or that the tech they might be focused on one state, but they might have a, a technology that you know um, once it's implemented in that state, the the kind of it it could also be extrapolated into other areas. Okay, um, but we yeah, this will be the last question because okay. I, I, I'm going to have to switch meetings. Um, yeah. Can we make an incentive payment to a producer for their own equipment, like a rental payment? Um, and also, is there a ceiling on uh, cash incentives to individual producers? So like um, a, a rental payment for their tractors or combines? Yeah, in terms of the rental payment, I believe the answer to that is yes. Caroline, you've you've I know you've encountered this before. Um, yeah. As long as it is appropriate as a you know um, a justifiable amount, as long as it's set at an appropriate amount, um, I believe that's fine. Is that can you correct me on that, Caroline? If I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, I think I think that's fine. I think and then, I mean that's for the incentive payment, so that's not actually. An equipment cost, right? Like yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I did. I, I misunderstood yeah, that. I thought yes, if it's an incentive payment, part of the incentive yes. payment. Yeah. Okay, 
then yes, that, that could be included. Um, there's not a cap. It's just it's something that is within reason. Um, so as part of your budget justification, it would have to be clear that you know you're not you're not paying an exorbitant amount for something that that just wouldn't be justified. Um, so with that, I, I apologize. Caroline and I are, are going to be jumping off to another meeting. Um, again, this recording will be available and we are available. I am available via email. So if you reach out to the SIG inbox, we'll be able to get you um, responses to your questions and the FAQ document should be posted shortly uh, to the SIG uh, website. So um, just really appreciate your time today. Thank you for your interest in the program. You know, if you listening to this feel like your project is a good fit for Arm Farm Trials, we we are excited to review your proposal. And again, thanks for taking the time today to learn more about the program. Um, and uh, we look forward to reviewing your proposals. All right, thanks again, all. Bye.